All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to day eight of Keyshot World 2020 Virtual Edition. As you know from the outset, this was nine days for Keyshot 9. So day eight means we're almost towards the end. I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, throughout this entire event. It's been really great. I've loved the feedback. I love the render contest. Uh, I've had a great time. So thank all of you for participating. Um, as I mentioned, we have two uh, sessions today. So this will be our last two sessions um, uh, or sort of hands-on sessions of the program. Tomorrow we're gonna come back with a designer round table. So we're bringing back Georgia Larte, we're bringing back Jacob Fine, we'll have Kareem, we'll have Will. We're gonna talk about uh, what we love about Keyshot, what we love about the event, kind of where we see things going with regard to design visualization in the future. So that's gonna be more of a, just a conversation between everyone to kind of put a, put a nice bow on our, on our wonderful, um, uh, sessions here at Keyshot World 2020. So today we have two sessions on lighting. The first is going to be lighting uh, essentials with Kareem Merchant. He's going to walk through lighting presets, drag and drop, how lighting works in Keyshot. Uh, there is content associated with that. So if you go to our agenda page and you see where it says uh, today's date and you see where the uh, events are, you'll see exclusive content from there. You can download uh, the content associated with Kareem's presentation. The second session at noon with Will Gibbons, that'll be Lighting Advanced. Will's gonna go through more of the advanced customizations you can do with lighting, as well as animating uh, with lighting in Keyshot. So if you've ever been curious about lighting in Keyshot, today is your lucky day. Uh, two great sessions, so thank you for coming. Um, um, Want to mention yesterday's session, Model Sets, Multi Materials and Studios of Ryan Levy. If you missed that, that is uh, on the agenda page. You can watch, very informative. Thank you to Ryan for all of his presentations. Uh, as always, everything is on our YouTube channel as well. So please subscribe to that. We'll, we'll be continuing to bring you great content um, uh, beyond this, this event here. Um, congratulations to Beth L. She won the uh, Hero 8 camera from GoPro yesterday. So thank you to the wonderful people at GoPro for providing that and congratulations to Beth L. Uh, today we have um, from the fine folks at Three Off The Page, a one week 64 core rental from their render farm. So if you don't know, Three Off The Page is the premier key shot render farm. Uh, so if you ever find yourself in a tight spot and need a little help, I recommend Three Off The Page. So we're gonna give that away today in the second session after, after the Q and a. Um, one fun announcement as well, people are asking kind of in the, in the Q&A on the forum, when is 9.2 coming out? Great news, next week. Uh, so we're bringing that out next week. For those who don't know, if you go on our forum for both 9.1 and 9.2, we've been releasing the betas uh, about, <coughs> excuse me, about three to four weeks before they go uh, um, out in, in the world. So you can test them, you can see what's in there. Um, this one has a ton of uh, performance improvements on the GPU, uh, a lot of great bug fixes, a lot of great fixes on the, uh, the importers and the plugins. Um, the main kind of feature in this one is uh, support for NVLink. So if you have a GPU, you have two RTX 5000s, NVLink's little chip, we put them together, you can share the memory. So it basically kind of expands out what you can do with that card. So if you're someone who is curious about NVLink, uh, I recommend checking that out. So yeah, 9.2 on its way. I just keep, I keep bringing some, everything, giving away giveaways, 9.2, just, a, just a, a good time. Um, on that topic, render contest, I've seen the ones that people have been putting in there so far, they look great. Reminder, it's running through next Monday. Uh, if you go to renderweekly.com, you follow renderweekly on Instagram, anyone can enter. You just need, the only requirement is grab something from the model uh, library. So if you click on uh, the, the cloud library in Keyshot, it brings up that cool uh, uh, recently redone uh, tab, shows you the models. Put any model in there, submit it, and you can win a Keyshot Pro license. So that's going to wrap up on Monday. So that's running all through this week. So a lot of fun stuff happening, like I mentioned, day eight. So let's get started with some learning, some great sessions. First up is uh, Lighting Essentials with Kareem Merchant. Kareem, take it away. All right. Good morning, everyone. Let me just get this situated here. Make sure that's off. All right, what's going on? My name is Kareem Merchant, as Derek just mentioned. I'm one of the creative specialists here at Luxion, and welcome to our morning lighting essentials workshop. A little bit about myself. I'm a recent industrial and product design grad from Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Since graduating, I've worked as a freelance industrial designer, and most recently, as a creative specialist here. I'm sure many of you have been longtime Keyshot users. I myself started using Keyshot just after Keyshot 6 release. And since then, it has been my go-to product viz program. 
I know many of you are usually curious about the desktops we use here. In the studio, we have a monster of a tower from Main Gear. It's uh, running an AMD Ryzen Threadripper 2990WX with 32 cores at 3 gigahertz. Uh, it has an NVIDIA Titan RTX GPU on board and 128 gigs of RAM. It's running Windows 10 Pro. It's definitely a powerful piece of machinery. If you're interested in a render rig, go check out Main Gear's website. They've got a bunch. All right, so in today's lighting essential session, I'll be covering the basics of lighting in general and giving you an overview of all the tools and ways you can use lighting to create more dynamic scenes and key shots. Use, acquire, and adjust your HDRI environments, and I'll discuss the different types of physical light profiles we have available in program. I'll then take a, a, a talk a bit about how, when, and why you should use different lighting options, as well as how to create custom presets, which is really easy, and import third-party HDRIs as well. Periodically, I'll jump in with a few demos so everyone can follow along. And don't forget, I know Derek mentioned that we have a, a few scenes available for download on our website as well. If you go to the agenda page next to this session, uh, some extra contents there for you to download. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A panel where we have some of our team members answering and directing them. On that note, let's start off by generally discussing lighting for photography. Uh, it's important to understand that as a key shot user, you're essentially acting like a product photographer and you should approach lighting your scenes with that in mind. The basic concept of lighting a scene in key shot is no different than operating lights in a physical studio environment, except you don't have the hassle of moving and staging large lights or physical cameras, soft boxes or tables, uh, makes it a lot easier. Uh, when staging lighting in or out of key shot, you can think of it as painting your object with light. Even the color and the tones are going to help tell your product story. Choosing the appropriate light temperature helps the stage a scene and makes it feel more realistic in context to your project. LED lights tend to be cooler than incandescent bulbs, which create a warm orange feel, and time of day can also be reflected by how cool or warm a light is. Uh, being aware of this can help you significantly increase the realism and believability of a product that might be used, let's say, near a window getting hit by natural light uh, versus a, a product that's entirely staged in a studio environment. It, it entirely depends on the mood and the feel that you're after at the end of the day. A common method that photographers like to use when lighting a subject is to use three-point lighting. Uh, this is where a main light or a key light is used to provide the lit subject with the greatest amount of illumination. It's usually from a front three-quarter angle. Uh, a fill light is then used to slightly reduce the shadows on the opposite side of the lit subject. And then finally, a backlight or a rim light, sometimes it's also called a, a hair light, is used to outline the subject from behind or above and separate that subject from its background. Uh, this effect can be achieved in key shot by using physical lights placed throughout the scene to recreate real world light sources. You can also create a three point lighting effect within the HDRI editor. However, the effect will end up being slightly different due to the manner in which HDRIs light a scene. Uh, I'll definitely elaborate that on that a little bit later in the presentation. And there are, there's plenty of other ways to light a scene as well. Yeah, even using just one light. But a three-point lighting setup is a pretty good place to start when you're looking to showcase product details overall as a whole. Uh, it does a really nice job of, of bringing everything into the picture. If you look at this slide, there's an image illustrating how a three-point lighting setup would look in practice. And I've kind of laid out where those lights are actually hitting on the model. And I'm going to actually open up that same scene you're looking at right there so we can take a peek at what's going on here. So here's a, a model from uh, Scan the World. It's an initiative that scans artwork and, and sculptural models that are, are historical. So it's a great, a great place. I believe it's on Mini Factory. If you go there, you can see all kinds of sculptures. But I decided to use this bust of David uh, in order to showcase our three-point lighting. So essentially, three-point lighting is just making sure that your whole subject is lit, but still trying to keep some of those, those uh, uh, details showing through by reducing the lighting on one side or accentuating lighting in another area. Uh, you can see that all the crevices of his face and, and his, his uh, neck and ears, they kind of stand out because the uh, fill light over here is, is not too bright. So in my scene, 
I have my fill light, I have my rim light, the sculpture itself and the key light. And right now it's just a neutral color. There's not much going on. And I'm sure many of you have seen these really cool photography uh, uh, images where people are adding all kinds of colors and using neon lights. So that's something that's become really popular. And actually, if you look at cinematic lighting, uh, typically it's an orange and teal kind of look going on to it. And all that is, is it's exaggerating the existing color spectrums that we find uh, in normal lights. Uh, like I said, LEDs are normally cooler these days. You can buy warm LEDs or soft LEDs, but typically an LED is a cooler or neutral look. Uh, sunlight is warm. So you can exaggerate those. You can use that to your advantage. As I said, if, you're, if you're, your scene is outdoors or if it's indoors. Um, but this is, this is a great way to kind of start by setting up your scene if you're showing off a product. Uh, again, there's, you can use spotlights and, and top lighting if you want to have like a concentrated effect on an image. But I, I like to use three-point lighting. And you can actually animate those, which I believe Will is going to be talking about in our afternoon session. But if you notice here, I have a few planes that I've created, and I'm actually using area lights in this situation. I recreated that using HDRIs as well. So let me go ahead and actually shut those lights off. And you see here, we're in a completely black environment. The, the subject is completely black. But if I go into my environments and I choose my three-point HDRI, I'm getting a similar effect. You can see here these images of the, the HDRIs I've set. It's a very similar effect, but you notice that it's a little bit different. Um, I can't completely light out the dark areas. Really dramatic. I like it nonetheless. Um, but yeah, you can, you can recreate that as well using HDRIs. Um, so that's, that's another way to do it. I'm going to go back to my environment that's black and enable my key lights. And we'll play around a little bit real quick with some colors. So, you know, if, if, if I'm going to say that this over here is a window that's letting light through and it's kind of near the end of the day, I can go into my color and actually change that color temperature to something that's going to reflect uh, that time of day or the light source that's, that's actually projecting that light on there. So I can just hit OK on there. You can see it's a lot warmer. We got a lot of bright lights up here that are neutral. Maybe get some blue on this one. But yeah, you have, you have a lot of control over the colors. If you're trying to make uh, some sort of like metallic object or glass and you want to have a bunch of colors flying through the area, you can exaggerate those and go with like pinks and magentas and blues. But I would definitely experiment with all the different lighting colors. You can, you can create effects. And especially if you're sticking your scene in, in, in somewhere that's like a city or a downtown or it's inside of like a restaurant that has a neon sign nearby, this is a great way to make your model feel like it fits in the environment. Let's go pause that and jump back in. Now we have a little background in lighting basics. We can start talking about different lighting presets we have available within KeyShot. Uh, located in the lighting tab of the project panel, we have access to our lighting presets as well as controls for adjusting and specifying how our presets will affect our final images. If you look at the screenshot on the side of the page, you'll notice that we have five preset lighting options plus the cu uh, custom preset option at the bottom of the list, which you can see right here. These, these I have highlighted because this is what you're, the majority of the time you're gonna be using unless you start uh, customizing things and you don't like that. But for quick outputs, these are pretty, pretty good to, to start with. Uh, the custom preset will automatically be enabled if adjustments are made to any of the lighting settings within the tab. Uh, it's also where you'll be able to save and delete presets that you've created. The performance preset is the first option on the list and it gives you the fastest rendering time of any of the preset options. Uh, it does this by reducing the ray bounces to zero and removing all effects such as ground and global illumination. You'll also notice that when toggled on, all effect controls appear grayed out and unusable. This is illustrated down here. Everything is grayed out. I can't really control anything that's going on there. Although you can't render out images with performance mode, be aware of that, because it automatically outputs in basic mode when you try, it can still help you maneuver around your scene super quickly. Uh, and it does blow out a significant amount of your image details, but it definitely has its uses. So uh, I would play around with that. I'm sure many of you have already. The next is basic, which enables ray bounces as well as self shadows to create a slightly higher level of realism within the scene. 
Uh, this is the output that rendered images will revert to if you try and render them with performance setting enabled. Basic is a pretty solid place to start with for rendering images. Most of the time, if I'm looking for a quick turnaround, I just use this setting to speed things up and I can still keep a, a decent level of realism in my images. If your goal is to get images out really quickly for design reviews or quick comps, this is definitely the setting you wanna kind of start with. All right, the following three presets are product, interior, and jewelry, which will generally be your most used presets when you're trying to create renders that are as realistic as possible. Each uh, will add an increased amount of ray balances and toggle additional settings that increase the realism of your renders. Something to note between product mode and interior mode is the way light is bounced around the environment. With product, your lighting tends to be more directional. Uh, it's focused at the subject or object that you're lighting. Uh, using this setting tends to create a brighter scene with less contrast, where using interior mode setting will increase contrast and bounce light around the environment, creating a more realistic effect in regard to how light moves through an environment. So we actually have some examples here. Uh, I kind of use this uh, uh, Triwa watch, which you can download from our cloud library as our, as our uh, excuse me, the benchmark image that I'm, I'm trying to use across all the different rendering modes. Uh, on this first slide, we're looking at a rendering using our basic setting. Uh, take note of the contrast of highlights versus shadows, as well as how the light reacts to the glass on the watch face. It's kind of flat. We're not seeing a lot of light come through there. A little bit at the top, you can see a little bit of, of light scattering right there. Uh, but for the most part, it's pretty flat against the grass, or against the glass, excuse me. On the second, we see the same benchmark scene rendered at 800 samples with product mode. Notice that they look fairly similar, but the overall quality of highlights and shadows and gradations has increased slightly. You can kind of see that there around where the, the glass of the watch face meets the metal beneath it. And then you can see that in the actual um, highlights in the background and on the, the watch face as well. The highlights are a little bit more realistic. You're catching sharper highlights in, in corners like this as well. The third is using interior mode with 800 samples. Again, you can see the shadows and highlights reacting a bit more realistically here. And the last is jewelry mode, which has the most intensive settings and will require the most amount of time to render out. Uh, jewelry has replaced the full simulation mode from previous versions of Keyshot, and it uses the entirety of the available effects as well as the largest number of ray bounces to achieve the highest level of realism. You also have caustics enabled here, which is why it works so well for jewelry, glass, and any gem-like material as a whole. Now, you notice here that there's little white dots going on on the glass. Uh, I could have probably rendered this at a higher amount of samples to get rid of some of those, but a lot of that is actually the light from the surface texture on the surface being caught by the glass. And you can also see on the glass surface, there's kind of a gradient of light that's permeating through the glass. The, the, this mode is able to catch that. And you have it on the interior mode as well. But once you start getting into product mode and basic, you kind of lose that. So it, it, you lose a little bit of that realism. And also the highlights in the back, you kind of lose that as well. Uh, caustics significantly increase the realism of how light passes through and reacts within clear and translucent objects, but it also requires a larger sample count, as I said, and rendering time uh, for best results. And that render time will be entirely dependent on the hardware you're using and whether you're rendering in CPU or GPU. As I stated before, there's also a custom preset option at the bottom of the list. Whenever an adjustment is made to the actual settings of any preset, the custom preset option will be automatically enabled. Uh, if the new preset is something that you really like and you'd love to use on future projects or other like scenes, you can toggle the add button symbolized by the plus sign to the right of the custom preset dropdown. This lets you add or delete presets that you've created. I'm actually gonna open up that file as well and then I'll show you a little bit with that. Bam, okay. So here we have our Triwall watch. Uh, as I told you earlier, you can get that watch from the cloud library. Um, inside the cloud library in our models, you can find that somewhere down here as, as it's loading. But yeah, this is where you would go to find that watch. Uh, you can honestly grab any of these models if you're playing around with lighting and they'll do a spectacular job 
uh, for letting you kind of figure things out and, and, and mess around. And I've seen some amazing renders this week of everybody using this. It's really impressive. So here we have a watch. Right now I have it just in basic mode. Um, what I was talking about in performance where a lot of your information is blown out, you can see here that it almost looks like a tune material. And the lighting obviously is, is completely uh, uh, incorrect for what I was going for, for a realistic uh, rendering. But it's a great way to kind of move around the scene and still be able to see your model without it having to render up quickly. So if you're trying to work on a model and, and you're not too concerned about uh, the way the light functions at that moment in time, it's a great way to be able to work quickly. Basic is kind of my go-to when I'm, I'm cranking out quick renders. Um, it, it does a pretty good job. It's still pretty quick. Uh, final render output is also fairly quick. So that's something to consider. And then we have product. You can see again, the lighting along this watch face is kind of immediately stepped up when I switched it there. Interior, we're starting to get the gradations on the glass. The actual uh, uh, light on the surface of the watch is becoming a little bit more realistic and defined. And then jewelry is, is very similar, but we're getting a little bit more real, uh, realism in the gradients and the reflections that are going on here. And you can see here too that uh, with jewelry, pretty much everything is currently checked. Shadow quality is higher and ray balances are higher. And uh, if you look down here at the rendering techniques, you have product mode and interior mode. So I have interior mode set up right now. Basically, what interior does is it bounces light around everything. So it's great for like a product in a studio or inside. Uh, it does a good job of kind of making it feel like there's walls nearby. And, and on that note, actually, when you're, when you're talking about three-point lighting or any other lighting thing, you don't actually need to set up a light source to create another quote unquote lighting panel, you can use objects to reflect that light. Like if you, if you have a wall, you can choose a material that will create a certain uh, uh, type of lighting on your, your subject. So you don't always need to have actual physical lights or HDRIs aimed at that area, especially if you want just like a really slight illumination from that end. Um, and then notice here too, if I, if I change anything right off the bat, it switches to the, the custom preset. And so I, I don't have a custom preset set up. Oh yeah, I do. So there's the custom demo. And that's actually what I rendered uh, out for the custom preset option, the images you looked at. So essentially just the ray bounces have gone up and I switched it to product mode instead of interior. So you can kind of see the difference in what's going on there. The, the product mode, it's overall a little bit brighter because it's concentrating the light on the subject rather than bouncing it off of the environment as the interior mode works. All right, let me pause that. So there you go, you can see that same image. Um, we have a little bit less of those fireflies going on I, I, due to my adjustments, but you can also see that a lot of this detail here is actually, let me, let me go back. A lot of that detail there is a little bit blown out. You don't see it as much. And that's because it's actually being able to render the depth of field a little bit more accurately as well. So that's, that's something to consider, definitely consider. Uh, something I want to emphasize is there is no one preset that works best. It entirely depends on your machine, your scene, and your end goal. And determining which preset works best for you will come down to experimenting in program and judging uh, based on what you need your outcome to be. So, but it, it's really, as you saw, really easy to jump between them and kind of see what's going on. If we now look at the environment tab in the project panel, we can see the chosen environment open for us to edit and adjust, which you can see down here. And I've actually broken this uh, image up. This should be on top of it as one. Um, um, when you open the program, you can see it like that, but just so it fits in the screen. Uh, here, the visible environment thumbnail will automatically represent the default HDRI unless you've assigned a different HDRI as your environment. And it will also illustrate where pins are located in the environment space. So this is the default and, and you can kind of see these lights. Those are essentially the pins that you'd see. That's the startup uh, uh, environment that, that nothing has been changed there. And then uh, you can see this illustrated in the screenshot of the environment tab on this slide. In the image to the right, you'll also notice that there are two sub tabs for controlling your HDRIs. On the left, we have the settings tab right here. And then the settings tab, which allows us to uh, make bright 
like brightness changes and contrast adjustments, as well as adjust HDRI size, height, and angle. And you can adjust what type of background is visible as well as toggle your desired ground effects. And then in this tab, you'll also be able to create multiple environments or HDRIs that you can non-destructively toggle between for different scene lighting options, which you can see right here, all we have is the background since that's the startup, but you can stack a bunch of them over here if you wanna look at how they will look and just jump through them really quick. The other editing space for your environments is the HDRI editor shown to the right of the slide over here. Here's where you'll be able to customize your HDRI's lighting as well as adjust light locations, your color effects. You can target highlights and adjust light temperatures as well. This is where you're really gonna have control over your HDRI's. And just under the sub tabs, you'll notice a series of icons that allow you to create different types of pin lights right here, this group of areas, specifically this area right here. Here you can either add pins to preset HDRIs to customize the existing lighting environment, or you could use these on a blank environment to create custom lighting environments from scratch. And then just to the left of that light pin tree, uh, right here where you can see all the other pins, you'll find another series of icons, which is where you'll be able to easily scroll up or down through the pins. You can delete unwanted pins and create folders to group pins that share attributes uh, to really streamline your workflow. And at the bottom of these icons, you'll also find a crosshair icon, which is an incredibly useful little tool. Selecting this icon makes adding highlights to specific areas of your model completely effortless. Uh, by selecting that crosshair and clicking on the area of your model you'd like your highlights to appear, Keyshot automatically orients the selected pin in a manner that creates your highlight at that desired location. So it's, it's really a useful little tool. You can see that right here. That'll be illuminated blue when you're using it. If you'd like to assign different environments to work with other than those that are preloaded in the environments tab of the library panel, uh, the first place you should look is the cloud library. You can access that cloud library easily within the program by selecting the cloud library icon on the bottom left of the program window. And this is a little snippet of some of our environments that are up there. Notice the little key shot flag. That means it's key shot approved. Uh, but these are, there's a lot of different environments and it's really nice to have that back plate image essentially part of your, your, your render and the lighting is already set up to reflect that. So if you're trying to create an outdoor scene, uh, you have the sun there, you can move the sun if you'd like. So it it's, makes it really, really easy to stage uh, your object in a place. And then you get the reflections of the scene as well. And then here's uh, where you'll be able to uh, download environments for use with your scenes. You can also upload your custom HDRIs to the cloud to give others access to your created lighting environments. And then outside of Keyshot, there are also plenty of HDRI resources online that you can pull HDRI maps from. Uh, I've had a few different names pop up over time, but the one that I consistently hear about is HDRI Haven. They have a huge selection to choose from and they are also free to download. So that's a, a great resource. And if you've acquired your HDRIs from a third party resource and would like to add them to your program tabs, you can either open the environments folder within your Keyshot program files uh, or you can designate a new folder that you have them in by opening the preferences window in the edit drop down at the top of the screen. And then let's actually go take a look at those real quick. Let's jump back in here. So like I said, cloud library, if you go to the environments tab, this is where you're gonna find your HDRIs and you can see a bunch of them there uh, always being added to. If you're an individual that's making our HDRIs, like all, I believe all these have been made by uh, users and then sent for approval and then they go up here once they are approved. So it's, it's a really great resource. We have plenty of them already built in, but if you need more, come here, it's a great place. Um, and then that's, that's where you'd get all your cloud library HDRIs. Uh, I kind of jumped in the HDRIs a little bit earlier. So let's open up our environment. And then I have a new environment here, which is kind of a three point lighting setup. Let me make sure. Yeah, so we have our, our environment here. It's kind of a, a three point lighting setup like I had at the very beginning. Uh, pull it off of custom. Let's go to product. Let's go to basic. Let's go back to jewelry. 
so you can see how how all these affect my scene like pretty drastically, especially when I'm working with the HDRI settings. So that's also something to consider versus physical lights. I'm picking up a lot of the background information as well of the surface that it's sitting on. But so you have your HDRIs here. Obviously everything looks great out in the moment and that's because this is locked. So to be able to edit your, your HDRIs, you need to make sure that your HDRI is unlocked. And so we can come in here and we can change the brightness of different uh, HDRIs. I can select which pin I want to adjust and then adjust those individually as well. Here's the settings tab. You can decide whether you wanna have a colored environment. Uh, you can actually choose the, the lighting environment. So if you drop an HDRI and I choose lighting environment, you'll see that HDRI environment in the back, as well as a backplate image if you just wanna use a backplate image. If you have that saved somewhere, you can pull that out uh, through that right there. And then of course your ground occlusion shadows, if you're trying to get really, really hard shadows, I actually like creating a surface that will reflect the object, which you can see here, uh, rather than using just ground shadows or occlusion shadows. That's my preference. But if you're just using the, the, the startup ground, you can play with these to kind of get new shadow effects that, that you might be after. Uh, you can also rotate your environment. So the light in this case is a three point, but I can choose where it's gonna go. Like it could be behind it, it could be in front of it. And then the HDRI editor itself, is pretty useful. It's uh, uh, it's an amazing little tool. You can change the different shapes of your your pins. You have rectangle and circular off the bat, but you can also like cut it in half if you want to create really sharp highlights, like across lenses on on glasses. Uh, it's a really useful tool. Here you can choose the colors and the temperatures of your lights as well if you're going for those really interesting colored effects. And then I can actually change it between grayscale and everything. I'm gonna to go to Kelvin real quick. So right there, you're actually looking at the color temperatures of, of how actual light would react. And you can get some blue or get some orange. Uh, it really just depends on what you're going for. And then all these different settings that exist. You have your, your tools here on the left where you can delete, scroll, and then you can also add a folder if you'd like and drop those pins into the folder. You can create half pins, rectangular pins, use images, uh, and then add circular pins as well. This is, this is a great little tool uh, to use, especially if you're trying to render quickly. Uh, HDRIs do a great job. Let me pause that. All right, so depending on your scene, lighting using HDRIs can be extremely efficient, both in time spent setting up your scene as well as time spent rendering. Typically, HDRIs are easier for your computer to render than using physical lights. However, using physical lights can create unique effects that you can't quite achieve from HDRI lighting alone. While HDRIs tend to illuminate all objects in the scene with the same origin location information, uh, physical lights will affect objects more like you would kind of witness in real life. If you notice on this page, I have two examples. One illustrates how a single point HDRI would affect a scene with multiple like objects. If you look at the lighting and shadows cast, everything appears to be relatively uniform. You can see that here. It's pretty much the same size, same length, all the way across uh, in the same direction. There's no differentiation. If you look to the image on the right over here, we have a scene that is set up in a very similar manner using a physical light rather than an HDRI. And notice that the shadows appear more accurate to the light source. You know, you can imagine the light somewhere over here. And then these images are showing it elongated as they're farther away. They're, they're kind of shifting direction if they're offset from the light as well. So that's, that's a much more realistic representation of how shadows work. Uh, rather than having shadows cast in the same direction and light fall on the objects in a uniform manner, the light can be seen here hitting each cylinder at a different angle. This can be observed in real life from pretty much any major light source. And using physical light instead of HDRIs can give your scenes a really dynamic realism that can only be achieved by doing so. However, be aware that using physical lights tends to be a lot more intensive to compute when rendering. And uh, they, it may also cause hot spots to appear and then lengthen the time it takes to render your final image. Again, a lot of that depends on your hardware as well. Now that we've covered lighting presets and HDRIs, let's transition into using physical lights to light your scenes. In Keyshot, you have the option to select between four different types of physical light sources that will each create a unique lighting effect within your scene. They can be applied through the material type dropdown under your material tab or by dragging and dropping preset lighting profiles from the lighting directory in your materials tab. As a forewarning, 
take care to ensure that your scene units are accurately set up to reflect real world measurements. Because uh, in order to have the, the best experience and the most success when adding light sources uh, to your projects, that's important. Uh, most light source options are pretty flexible. Uh, they're flexible enough to compensate for non-accurate unit settings. However, uh, you'll definitely experience issues when you're dealing with IES lighting profiles. And let's go ahead and break down our different light sources in a little bit more depth. The first light source we're going to discuss is area lighting which you actually saw at the very beginning when we were looking at that bust of David. Uh, area light acts similarly to a floodlight where the source casts light outward and fills the scene from the point of origin. The easiest way to create area lights for me is to drag and drop geometry from the models tab in the library panel and then change your material type to area light. You can also use existing geometry or you can actually physically create that geometry in your modeling program by just dragging and dropping it from the actual uh, geometry tab is, is really quick and easy. Uh, personally, I like to use area lights when creating large light sources such as panel lighting for a studio scene or for mimicking light cast through windows or open doors. I would also choose this light type when looking to create soft diffuse lighting effects within a scene. For these use cases, uh, using a simple plane to create lighting, uh, a lighting panel works exceptionally well since it can be easily adjusted to the dimensions of a real panel you might find in the studio. Area lights tend to be softer, so they do an excellent job creating a similar effect to a softbox in a studio environment. Another interesting effect to consider uh, when using area lights is how your shadows appear. Uh, smaller dimension area lights typically have sharper shadows with shadows softening as the light source becomes larger. And on this slide, you can see a series of examples using an area light to light the scene. Notice how the reflection of the light on the model and the shadow softens as the light source increases in size. And this is actually an image from our manual. Again, a great place to look when you have questions. But you can see that very small light source right here is kind of creating a really sharp shadow. And then the more light that's being cast around that environment, we have a much softer shadow over here. And let me open up my lighting and we'll show you some area lights real quick. I have this scene too, which everybody has. And essentially all I've done here is taken a key shot ball, which I'm sure you're all familiar with at this point, and assigned our four uh, physical lighting profiles over here. On the far left, we have an area light that I created using our geometry from our models tab. So, you know, if you wanted to create another one, you just drop it in here and you can see the plane is actually on the floor. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna light this one from the bottom to show you. So right now it's just a, a, a plain diffuse material. If I double click that and I go here to the material type drop down, I can click on it and then I can go down all the way to the light sources and choose from my four physical lights. I'm gonna choose area light right there. And you can see that it's kind of like a low emanation blue, but you're getting that kind of on the bottom of this. It's at a thousand lumens right now. You have watts. So you can see the difference between how key shot watts work and lux. Uh, lux and lumens, I, I like to really use, I feel like they kind of represent real lighting a little bit better, but watt is also a great option, uh, especially if your scene units are off. If you switch to watts, you can really easily power that, that light so that it compensates for it. I mean, cause we're going down here pretty low and you're getting this really cool effect. And then again, you choose the color. I have it set to the Kelvin scale right now. So you can choose whether you want warm lights, neutral lights or cool lights. Uh, but area lights are great. I love using them. I, I, they're like my go-to when I'm lighting a product. I, I typically use area lights as a means to, to light those products. Let me hide that plane real quick. Um, and then, of course, we have the one up here. I have it set to 2,000 lumens, and it's kind of a warm color going on right now. And then, as I said, here's your, your models in your geometry directory, and you can pull a bunch of these in there. Uh, all these lights were created using the geometry here. So you're always gonna have to have a material and you can also drag and drop. So if I go to my light right here and I hit that plus, you can see that we have all our, our different types of lights over here. Now, I didn't touch on emissive. Uh, emissive is not really a, a great choice if your goal is to illuminate something within a scene, but uh, emissive does a great job for like creating LED lit buttons, that kind of thing. If you're going to light a scene, you definitely want to use either the area light, the IES, the spotlight. Uh, those are all great options to use. And we'll come right back to the scene in a minute here. The second light source we're going to 
take a look at is IES lighting. Uh, when using IES profiles, it's imperative that your scene units reflect real world dimensions due to the fact that IES light profiles are built to reflect actual light output parameters. Uh, if your scene units are incorrect, you'll most likely experience issues using these types of lights in your scenes. IES lighting can be an extremely helpful tool for interior designers or architectural designers who are interested in creating interior lights that may be implemented in future physical spaces. And a useful aspect of, of using IES lights is being able to import IES profiles for lighting from uh, common manufacturers. This allows you to create scenes which accurately reflect certain manufactured light sources uh, and you can see how they work in your interior environment. And there are several IES profile options available to drag and drop from the materials tab in the library panel. But if you'd like to import uh, lighting profiles from outside sources, you can also easily do so by selecting the load IES icon to the top right of the, or on the right of the file name input field in the materials tab of the project panel. And you can see an example here, similar to the example of the, the file we were just looking at, where an IES light is, is kind of acting like a wall sconce light and it's casting light down on this plane. And this, the key shot ball is receiving some of that light bouncing off the ground and bouncing off the wall. Let me open up that scene again and we will look at our IES lights. So uh, here I have my IES light. You can see that here, it's a wireframe. Uh, you can't actually see the physical uh, object that's creating that light unlike an area light, um, but it, it'll react like a wireframe and actually all these react like a wireframe when you click on them. Oh, I missed that one, it's probably up here somewhere. But yeah, so uh, this is our IES light right here and you can see that similar to a wall sconce or some sort of wall mounted lighting, we have that effect occurring, like there's a housing on it. And you have a lot of different IES options you can choose from here, um, warm to cool to neutral, uh, you can mess with those, but they all have different effects. You can see like maybe if I drag and drop this one over here, that's kind of a, a spotlighting effect and you can see what's going on there. And then again, you go to your material, this case, Watts, Lumens, and Lux are available as well. Oh, actually, we're in the, the, the area light, sorry, because that shouldn't be the case. All right, so here you have your multiplier, yeah. So this, since this is based off of real world lighting parameters, you don't have as much control over it, but you can change the color. You can change how cool it is, how, how warm it is, uh, if it's neutral. And then the multiplier is great too, because you can really crank up that light. But notice like I'm all the way up over here. It's only at five, but it, it still is not really blowing out the scene entirely like you might get from an area light. You can also increase the radius and then that'll kind of make the image less sharp uh, of the light being cast or you'd be really low if you want it extremely sharp. Um, so that's one way the multiplier is, uh, excuse me, one way you can compensate for having incorrect scene units, but it does have its limitations. And then if you want to load different profiles right here on the right side of the file uh, name field. You just click on that guy, it'll open up uh, where, it'll open up the browser and you can search for where you've saved those and actually load in custom IES profiles. So that's, that's also a great place to look. Let me pause that again. And then we'll actually look at a little example of those IES lights. These are a bunch of IES lights that I've dragged and dropped. Uh, onto the, the scene that you just saw, and I've, I've put their names at the bottom too if you wanna play around with them. These have been adjusted a little bit, some warmer, some cooler, uh, but that's a, a little example of how IES lights work. And that light that's going in the back is because the light is actually casting on the, the surface of the wall. So let's go over to point lighting. All right, the third light source we're going to look at is point lighting. Typically, point light is used to create strong light sources that cast a hard shadow. Point light is omnidirectional, which means it essentially acts as a miniature sun in the way it casts light around itself. It's an invisible light source, like you saw before, so when it's applied to a piece of geometry, the geometry is replaced by a representative wireframe. Uh, when adjusting your point lights, you have the option to adjust between two power types, watts and lumens, and you're able to adjust the power output with the power slider, as well as the radius of your light source. Uh, if your light radius is adjusted to a small number, then your shadow will appear sharp and fully defined, while larger numbers 
typically soften and diffuse your shadows cast by the object. And here you can see we have two planes and the reflection in the key shot ball. And then you also have the reflection of the light at the bottom. So essentially the, 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 the orb, the point lighting orb is in the center here and you're catching that reflection on all these surfaces and you can kind of see that light scattering past that surface as well. So that's how that would work. And here's some images from our manual again. Uh, on this slide, we can see how a larger radius size affects our object's cast shadows. On the left, we have the point light source set to a small number. And as we move right, the radius increases. Uh, as it increases, you can see the softness of the cast shadow increase as well. And you can also see that the surrounding environment maintains an evenly illuminated look on all the walls within the scene. And I'll jump again back into that same scene. And you can, you can jump in and play with these and apply whatever you'd like to any of them. Right there we have it, and you're not actually seeing the orb itself. What you're seeing is the reflection of that orb floating in the air against the material that the back is made out of. So yeah, and, and that's, that's what's going on there. It's actually projecting light 360 degrees rather than it being a directional light. And again, you click on it, watts, lumens, you can change the power, the radius, you can change the color if you'd like. Uh, a lot of great controls, works really well if you're, if you're creating some like a, a, a light bulb, uh, that's one way to do it, unless you're trying to create uh, a directional light as well. All right. And then the fourth and final light source we're going to discuss is the spotlighting type. Essentially a spotlight can be thought of as a point light that has been clipped so the light is emitted in a conical manner and these lights function similar to studio or stage lights where light is condensed within a projected area. Spotlights are best used for creating dramatic overhead lighting when lighting objects such as vehicles or products and can also work really well when being applied to more concentrating lighted elements such as like overhead can lights in an interior scene. Uh, spotlights can also create some incredibly dramatic effects when used with scattering medium to showcase a product or an object. And with that, I think we're gonna wrap up our essential session and let's open it up for Q&A. Wonderful, thank you so much, Green. That was a very informative and thorough <coughs> overview of, of lighting. Um, can you do me a favor and bring up KeyShot and then just bring in any object, just import any object. One, one uh, uh, person had a question of how, <coughs> how it scales to the objects. And I wanna uh, show from, you that, From the uh, library? So, uh, no, just import from the file import menu. Just bring like an OBJ. If you go file import, and then if you have any kind of, um, I don't know, you know OB, or just any file. Yeah, let's, um, uh, I mean, uh, I actually don't have any loose oh, files okay. in here. They're all packaged. Okay. Well, but, uh, when you would come in, basically the import dialogue will have two things that say adjust environment to fit geometry. Uh, and so in the import settings, that's where you would see that option. Um, a couple of people asking about uh, uh, the ground size under environment. Uh, and how you uh, control the, the, the virtual ground and key shot. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, ground size, it, it kind of diffuses the shadow when it's there. Um, like I said earlier, I personally like actually adding a ground plane and working from that because I feel it makes more realistic uh, ground effects. But if you have a really small ground size, typically your, your shadows are going to be a little bit more constrained and then larger ground sizes disperse that shadow over the surface a bit more. So that's something to take into account as well. And then obviously any of these ground effects that you choose will affect that ground, the startup ground, and not a, a, a ground material that you place. And if you wanted to add geometry and add a ground plane, you could do that right there. Or you can also use an actual plane and, and it's really up to you. Uh, in your initial example, where you sort of showed the three-point lighting, um, if you can go kind of go back to that with the, the yeah, real quick, can you just people were kind of asking basically, you know, was that a preset you created, or did you just kind of create that as you were beginning? So if you, I, you kind of touched upon this earlier by kind of just bringing geometry in, but if you can qu quickly yeah. show how you put that together. Yeah, I I uh, I, I first started with my uh, my bust of David over here, and I worked from uh, the startup HDRI just so I could see what was going on. And then it, it's, all I did was I came to my geometry tab, I pulled in a plane, whoa, I pulled in a plane, and then that plane obviously will show up on the ground or wherever you put it, and then you can move that plane uh, uh, around to suit you depending on where you want to light. I don't know what's going on there. 
but yeah, you'd be able to uh, just pull that plane up, move it around, and then that's going to kind of determine where, let me open up one of the other files. I'm not sure why that's going on here. So if I'm, if I'm pulling in a plane, that plane's going to actually drop below my plane that's going on right now. I can pull it up and there's a scale issue, as you can see. So I can scale that plane up to where I need it. I can rotate that plane. And also if you hit shift, you can kind of lock the degree that it's, it's, it's uh, rotating to, which is also a very useful tip. You can also change the scale inside the scene menu rather than just playing with this uh, uh, little square because that's a lot less accurate. But essentially I would just put my, my geometry, I could use a rounded cube or a sphere or whatever I'm looking for and place that geometry somewhere in my scene. And then once I have that geometry, I can either drag and drop uh, an area light. So I'll just start with doing that. Let's just drag this guy right here. It's a neutral light. I can drag and drop an area light, one of the many that exist here. Or I can also go here to my material type drop down on the right from the material tab. And then from there, you can choose between the different lighting profiles you like. And then when you just choose an area light, it's going to give you a neutral light. And then from there, you'd have to actually manipulate the settings to, to uh, get it to where you'd like it to be. But yeah, you, again, you can change color. Uh, and choose whether it's reflected in different things. And, but yeah, that's, that you're going to use geometry and you're going to move that around and place it where you'd like. Think of it exactly like uh, uh, studio lights. If you had a product on a table and you wanted to light it, you'd move those lights physically. That's how you'd use physical lights as well in Keyshot. Wonderful. Uh, some folks were asking when you were back in the HDRI editor how to save, <laughs> how to save that out. You know, I don't think so, I have uh, actually if you saved go, it. Yeah, so you go to the, yeah, go to the HDRI editor tab there, uh, down there, and then you'll see the little floppy disk there for people who remember what floppy disks were. Right here, right here. Uh, if you click on that, then you can basically save save that out, and that will save to your library. So if if you're working on one, you really like it, you can basically put it and kind of select which of those folders uh, you want to place that into. Um, I'm often bringing in models from different sources that can be wildly different. Do you have any tips for managing units and scale within Keyshot? Yeah, that can, that can get pretty uh, uh, hairy sometimes, especially when one model is like maybe the correct geometry and something else is not. Uh, you can, if you are aware of that previously, you can kind of change the, the import settings so that it's, it's not, horribly off compared to another model. Um, but I have in a lot of instances physically scaled it down after importing it and put it in a different location. And sometimes that's not a bad idea either because uh, especially if you're trying to get like a, a really close up shot on something and you want something to appear larger, uh, but the even though the uh, uh, perspective is correct and you can even mess with the perspective here to kind of create that more dramatic look but if you want that object to be a little bit more prominent you can fudge the uh, scale a little bit to kind of get what you're going for so um, I, I personally like to actually manipulate the scale myself and again you can either do that with that little uh, scale when you when you're in the move menu and you when you hit a like move model you can select scale and then do it with this square right here uh, or you can go into the scene you choose the object or you know, let's say it's the, the glass right here. And then I go into the scene and I can choose in my position, the scale of that glass and blow it out. And you can actually input things here as well. So that's, that's a great little way to do that. Uh, so people were asking earlier uh, for like kind of like uh, the, the, the different lights, if there's a clear way to see which sort of direction the light is pointing, like if it's sort of um, an, an arrow that kind of uh, clearly explains sort of the direction of light. I guess beyond just sort of where the light is in, you know, visually. Yeah. When you actually drag and drop, usually I, let me, let me grab a high yes light. I'll just maybe grab one of these guys. Um, it could be one of the settings that's causing it not to, but usually what happens is when it shows you the wireframe, it'll have like a line coming down from it uh, that, shows you the direction in, in which it's, it's actually aiming. That doesn't happen for area lights, uh, but for area lights, it's a lot easier to kind of see what's going on because you're actually looking at the light. Um, when it comes to uh, point light, it doesn't matter so much since it's 360 degrees, but definitely when you're using IES lights or spotlights, uh, it, it makes a, a big difference. Let me click on that spotlight. 
it makes a big difference. And you can kind of see with spotlights again, it's casting light. And the only reason why you're seeing it on the back here is because it's so close to that surface. Cause typically you'll actually have an effect that looks like this. If there's no wall behind it, you're just catching that light hitting the top of the object and going down. But I guess lights, it does help a lot. Um, but for the most part, uh, when you drag and drop it, the wireframe will give you that information. So look for that. And can you drive where that spot hits by clicking on the object itself? Not with physical lights. With HDRIs, you can. Um, let me go into this watch scene. And so, like, if I'm if I'm in the uh, environment tab in the HDRI, and let's say I make a, a new HDR or a new pin here, I can have this illuminated blue, which means it's toggled on, and then I can just kind of pick a spot and then notice on the right here that that pin is going to actually move around depending on where I click it. So, you know, if I want a, a highlight like on this ridge right here, on this ridge right here, and I want to make that even bigger on the side, I can click on that area and then I can adjust the radius. I can adjust the brightness. And then that's kind of how I'd control that. But that's an awesome feature on HDRIs being able to do that. It makes it really easy. Okay, great. I'm just going through here. It looks like we've kind of answered most of There's a couple of questions people have about animating lights. Um, we'll save that for the next session. Uh, just for, for those who were or maybe came a little late, uh, this is basically covering kind of the, the overarching um, kind of usage of light in Keyshot. Our second session, which will be at noon today, will be lighting advanced. So that's going to go more into uh, customizing and animating lights. So that'll go into even greater detail uh, on some of the topics that Kareem touched upon today. Awesome. Uh, is, there to, is there a way to lock the position of the lighting to the camera position? So basically, as the camera is moving, the lighting is still setting up oriented to how the camera is going. I'm actually not sure that's possible, uh, especially with the area lights. The area lights are like physical geometry, so they're going to react like physical geometry. Um, but off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I can definitely get back to you with that question if uh, they want to email me directly. Okay. Great. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. So I think with that, we'll kind of wrap it up. <coughs> Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, reminder, we have one more session today at noon, as I mentioned, uh, and then we'll have uh, a designer roundtable tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, closing out our virtual key shot world. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending. Reminder, the second uh, session today will be our giveaway, which is uh, a one-week 64-core uh, render credit from the folks at 3D Off the Page. So thank you, Kareem, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you to everyone for joining, and we will see you hopefully all uh, at noon today, Pacific time. Bye.